time while he continues an appeal. I'm Lisa Brady, Fox News Radio. Knowing the truth with Pastor Kevin Bowling is a live call-in radio program providing doctrinal dialogue, cultural commentary, and insightful interviews with some of today's foremost Christian authors and leaders. Knowing the truth is the outreach ministry of the Mountain Bridge Bible Fellowship located on Highway 25 in Traveler's Rest. The goal of the church and the radio program is to seek the glory of God in the salvation of sinners and the sanctification of the saints by the ministry of the word. For more information, go to www.knowingthetruth.org. Here with today's edition of Knowing the Truth is Pastor Kevin Bowling. Hey, welcome into this Thursday edition of the Knowing the Truth radio broadcast. This is Pastor Kevin Bowling, and we're going to talk about uh, an extremely important subject today. We're going to be talking about the subject of grace, and we're going to be talking about the subject of grace in um, uh, maybe a sense that you haven't thought about it previously up until this point. Uh, to be more specific, we're actually talking about uh, something called the doctrines of grace. We've talked about them many times on the program before, but the doctrines of grace are a term that is uh, synonymous with maybe a more familiar term that you've heard over the years called Calvinism. And a lot of po folks uh, would uh, refer to the five points of Calvinism specifically. But we're going to talk about the doctrines of grace from a couple of different aspects today. First, we're going to uh, get our special guest today to give us a little bit of a recap of what he wrote in the first book in this series about the foundations of grace. Just a quick synopsis of uh, what was covered in that book. And then we're going to launch into a look at a new book that actually actually isn't even released yet. It won't be released until um, February, I think, of next year. And so we'll be looking forward to that. But the book that I'm referring to is the book Pillars of Grace. It's released by, will be released by Reformation Trust Publishing, which is the publishing wing of Ligonier Ministries. Uh, folks listening to this broadcast are very familiar with Ligonier, but that's the teaching ministry of Dr. R.C. Sproul. And so we're going to be talking about this particular subject here today, the doctrines of grace. Let me read this statement to you that I put out on the, uh, the blog uh, that gives a little bit of information about what the program is going to be about today. I wrote this, and this was taken directly from the publisher. It says, the doctrines of grace are often known as the five points of Calvinism, but they were not the in invention of John Calvin or his reforming cohorts of the 16th century. Rather, they are biblical doctrines, as Dr. Steve Lawson demonstrates in his book, Foundations of Grace, first put out in 2006. And now in Pillars of Grace, Dr. Lawson shows that the doctrine of grace has been understood and taught, sometimes in embryonic form, sometimes with great clarity throughout church history. From the time of the early church fathers to the years of the Reformation, there has been key men in the church, pillars, as it were, who stood on the foundation of Scripture and upheld the truth of God's sovereign role in salvation. In Pillars of Grace, Dr. Lawson walks readers through the ups and downs of church history, profiling these voices for the truth. The inescapable conclusion is that the doctrines of grace are no innovation, but the consistent witness of some of the greatest men of the church. With that, let me introduce my uh, special guest again today on the Knowing the Truth radio program. My guest is Dr. Steve Lawson. Dr. Lawson is the senior pastor of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. I had the uh, pleasure this year of visiting there. I attended the Expositors Conference that took place there. It was absolutely excellent. Uh, both uh, Dr. Lawson and Dr. Dr. R.C. Sproul were the speakers for that event. Uh, beyond that, was able to meet uh, some of the folks there in the church, just a wonderful congregation, and um, they just treated us like royalty while we were there. Just had a wonderful time. Myself, Stephen Lee, and uh, some folks from our church as well all went down there to uh, for this conference. He's also the author of 15 different books, including 
and he's been on the prog- uh, broadcast for these as well. The unwavering resolve of Jonathan Edwards, the expository genius of John Calvin and the foundations of grace. Dr. Lawson is also the president of the New Reformation Ministries. It's designed to bring about biblical reformation in the church today. And he also serves on the executive board at the Master's Seminary and College. And with that, Dr. Lawson, it's certainly a privilege to have you back on the Knowing the Truth radio program again today. Kevin, thank you so much. I love being on your program, and I'm grateful for your ministry there. I uh, wanted to get you, as you could hear from my introduction, I thought to give a little bit of a context. This is the second book in the Long Line of Godly Men series, and so I thought that we shouldn't just dive into the second book without getting you to give us a little bit of a snapshot of what you covered in the first book. So if you would do that, please, that would be wonderful. I would love to, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Volume 1, which is entitled Foundations of Grace, really presents the biblical uh, case for the doctrines of grace. And what I do uniquely in this book, I think uh, in a way that is different from any other book on this subject, is I start in Genesis 1 and end up in Revelation 22 and cover the doctrines of grace as they come up with each individual uh, biblical author. So, for example, the book begins with a chapter on Moses and the first five books in the Bible and the Pentateuch, and what does Genesis have to say? Uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, regarding the doctrines of grace, and then I just work my way progressively through the rest of the Old Testament What did David have to say, Solomon, and then Isaiah, the major prophets, minor prophets? And it's it's a very, um, I think, helpful study to see that virtually all of the biblical authors addressed in one way or another uh, the doctrines of grace. Of course, when we come to the New Testament, Kevin, as you know, Mm -hmm. um, it becomes crystal clear. Uh, I have two chapters on uh, the teaching of Christ. Uh, first in the Synoptics with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then a standalone chapter with the Gospel of John on these doctrines of sovereign grace. And it it becomes an overwhelming case that is crystal clear uh, that all of the biblical writers speak with one voice uh, regarding these doctrines of grace. And and just to summarize what those are, uh, Kevin, uh, radical corruption... Uh, sovereign election, uh, particular redemption, uh, irresistible grace, and then uh, preserving grace. And, and those five doctrines, and I also add two others. One, just divine sovereignty in general, a meaning over providence and the affairs of life, and then also a section on reprobation uh, regarding the non-elect. And, uh, of course, I then trace it through the rest of the New Testament uh, with, with Luke, uh, Book of Acts, with Paul and his 13 epistles, uh, the author of Hebrews, James, uh, I have Peter, and then the, I conclude with the Apostle John, hmm. um, also Jude. Um, and so as R.C. Sproul told me, he said, I, I, I'm not aware of another book that approaches these doctrines of sovereign grace this way. Normally there will be five chapters on the five doctrines of grace, Mm -hmm. and they're systematically all pulled together in a chapter apiece. This really is what we would call a biblical theology in that we we trace the unfolding progression uh, of of these doctrines as they are unveiled uh, in Scripture. As we know, the Bible was written over a period of approximately... Uh, 1,600 years, Mm -hmm. uh, beginning with the Pentateuch and Moses and ending up with John on the island of Patmos. Of course, that depends on when we date the writing of the book of Job. But uh, let's say it's 1,600 years. Uh, We have our Bible in hand, and we have it all at once, but it was written over a lengthy period of time. And so I trace this development in the Scripture and it, it makes, I think, for a very fascinating case, and I've tried to address virtually every Bible in the Scripture on the subject of the sovereignty of God as it flows from these five truths. 
And uh, how amazing is this that uh, 1,500 years, as you were saying, with, I believe, 40 different writers from all different backgrounds, and yet, as your study shows, in just the putting the filter of the of the sovereignty of God and the points of uh, the sovereignty of God that you described, often described under the headings of Calvinism and Tulip, but using that as a filter, the tremendous continuity and unity of thought throughout those 1,500 years. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing, and of course it all points to... Uh, that the ultimate source is one, which is the tri- our triune God. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the Word of God is very simply that, the, the revelation that God has given to us regarding His truth. And uh, it all points back to, really, the divine authorship of, of Scripture, that there is one body of truth uh, that is taught, and the Scripture in no, in no place contradicts itself. So that does it with the uh, your first book, that uh, yes. being the first book, The Foundations of Grace, uh, primarily with a biblical theology looking at the 66 books of the Bible and under this microscope of can we identify throughout all of these books one thought concerning the, or not one thought, but a continuity of thinking concerning the doctrines of grace. If that's true in the, the first book, then the second book would it be a fair assessment of it to say that this is now a historical theology looking for the very same thing, but throughout the historical figures in the early church and all the way up until the Reformation. Yes, Kevin, that, that's a very good uh, synopsis. Uh, what I do is trace the teaching of these doctrines of grace throughout church history in this volume from the 1st to the 16th century. And just a, a brief statement in the next volume... Uh, I'll trace it from the 16th century to the present hour, Hmm. such that these three volumes will form a trilogy, and it will begin with Moses, uh, the first biblical author, and conclude with men like R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur uh, in the present hour. And um, this second volume, Pillars of Grace, um, I begin with uh, the Church Fathers, the first church fathers were contemporaries of the apostles and then trace this through the church fathers, through the dark ages, through the monastics, through the scholastics, through the pre-reformers, and then finally come uh, to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, and, uh, and show uh, what the reformers had to say about this doctrine And I think what is unique, uh, the unique contribution here, Kevin, is that I quote um, the 23 uh, leading figures of church history uh, of this point uh, in their own words. Mm. So I'm not merely talking about them. I'm actually giving them a platform and allowing them to speak. Uh, There's over 3,000 footnotes uh, in this volume and allowing the 23 key men of, of church history from the 1st to the 16th century, uh, allowing them to speak for themselves. I uh, noticed I was reading through um, Ligon Duncan's uh, introduction to the book, or his preface to the book, I should say. Sure. Uh, just excellent, where he talks about um, uh, J.I. Packer and him uh, d- defining what the doctrines of grace include. And I'll just commend that section to the uh, to the readers. He refers to your first book, Foundations of Grace, as a tour de force of uh, of looking at the sovereignty of God in all of its aspects there. But I wanted to give you before we start delving into some of these sections that are there a key word that is used of course in the second book is the idea of pillars and right away we we think of the scriptural use of that term uh speaking about those uh the apostles being pillars in the in the church in the apostolic age but also where the scripture and the church itself is referred to as the pillar and the ground of the truth uh, speak to us just for a moment about that term and why you selected it as in the title of this book and how important that is. Yes. Uh, well, this becomes an extension of, the, of Volume 1, which is Foundations of Grace. And so to extend the metaphor, it is p- uh, pillars that rest upon a foundation. 
and volume three will be pinnacle of grace, mm-hmm. which would be the the the, the rooftop. But uh, really, the imagery of a temple of truth, uh, the scripture, of course, is that foundation, and the pillars really uphold the truth in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Galatians 2, uh, the early church leaders were identified by Paul as pillars in the church, giving support uh, to the pure teaching of the Word of God and through their spiritual leadership. And there are other passages to cite. You quoted First Timothy 3, that the church is to be the pillar and support of the truth. Uh, that is our role, to be upholding uh, the truth. When you come to church on Sunday, that should be the one place, one time in the week that you hear the pure, unadulterated truth uh, of God's Word. And so these early leaders were pillars um, in that uh, they formed a, a colonnade, if you will, mm. century by century, uh, upholding the truth and our sovereign God appointing different men at different epochs of history uh, to fulfill their role at that God-appointed hour. Hmm. Um, you uh, write there in that, that section speaking about the uh, the pillars and the uh, the colonnade, as you just pointed out, you know, is just excellent in the, uh, I guess it's in the preface, is it? Yes, That you preface. write for the book, right. And it's just excellent uh, the way that you put that all together and the the solidarity of the, the truth that is proclaimed by the men that you are pointing to in this book. Um, I think it was uh, Albert Moeller that talked about the, surprising uh, conformity of thought that when you look at the or think about the church fathers most people would say okay I can imagine that there would be a a unity or a consistency in their teaching and belief about the subject Trinitarian doctrine and maybe Christology but is there really a continuity of belief and teaching about the sovereignty of God and the doctrines of grace and that's what you he says that he's surprised to find out through your labor here of pouring over this that that's exactly what the conclusion is at the end of this book yes uh, there is continuity and uh, there is admittedly development within that continuity Um, and really what I'm driving at here were there Calvinists before Calvin (laughs) (laughs) were there reformers before the reformers Uh, who held to these truths, and the answer is, in the affirmative, the answer is yes. Now, it will take time for this to be uh, developed, for there to be cause and effect to be seen within doctrines of theology. Um, And initially, the early church, Kevin, as you know, uh, was having to fight on certain battlefronts uh, regarding the Trinity itself. Uh, regarding the deity of Christ, uh, regarding the deity of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. uh, regarding which books would be in the canon of Scripture, uh, and regarding the hypostatic union of Christ, uh, his humanity and deity. And what we learn from church history, and this is very interesting, is that it is controversy that drives more careful thought Mm -hmm. and, and more precise articulation of the truth, and it requires negative denials as well as positive assertions. And until there is controversy, the truth has not been always articulated uh, as crisply uh, as we would like it. And so the controversy surrounding the doctrines of grace did not come until the 5th century uh, with a man named Pelagius, And so previous to that, uh, the great minds and leaders of the church were having to combat uh, heresies uh, in other areas Mm -hmm. where there were denials of the Trinity, denials of the deity of Christ, uh, denials of the deity of the Holy Spirit. And so their, their energies and efforts were poured out in defending those essential truths, as well as, and this is important, as well as just the the sheer proclamation of the gospel itself. Uh, As the church will spread out of Jerusalem and and throughout the Roman Empire, uh, it it was a gospel movement. 
and they were more concerned with what the gospel is than pulling back the veil and the fuller story of how it is that someone comes to believe the gospel. Mm -hmm. Uh, At that point, they are simply trying to make a dent into the Roman Empire and preach the gospel, and there were so many Greek philosophies and philosophers uh, that they were having to um, um, uh, combat, as well as some of them drew even from Greek philosophers um, as they would articulate the, the Christian faith, such that it wasn't until the 5th century with Augustine that someone really began to roll up their sleeves and, and dig more precisely into the doctrines of sin and grace. And so that's, that's what emerges. Previous to that, though, I have isolated uh, with these key figures in their own words their statements regarding sovereign grace. And what's interesting, for example, is with Clement of Rome, who is the first man that I address, mm-hmm. his very first sentence of the oldest extra-biblical book that we have. He begins by addressing uh, the saints as, as the chosen ones, mm-hmm. the, the elect of God. And so th- there was no shying away uh, from these truths from the very outset, from the very beginning. And so uh, I, I think the reader of, of this book will be um, uh, surprised, maybe, as Dr. Moeller expressed, mm-hmm. uh, but also encouraged that what we believe uh, regarding the sovereignty of God in salvation was not a theological novelty in the 16th century, that Calvin and Luther actually quote extensively from the Church Fathers, uh, from Bernard of Clairvaux later, uh, and many other men who preceded them such that uh, Calvin actually says in his Institutes, when, he, when the Reformers were being attacked by the Roman Catholic Church for teaching something new, Calvin argues, no, it's the total opposite. Hmm. We stand on the shoulders of the Church Fathers and those who have gone before us. It is Rome who has invented a new way of salvation. And so constantly they were appealing to those men who had gone before them. So I have studied those men and have, and have attempted to pull out of their writings uh, their key sentences and paragraphs where they address uh, the subject of the sovereignty of God in salvation. Hmm. I was going to ask you, what is the importance then of studying the Church Fathers? I think that uh, many people in modern Christianity today um, feel that the Church dropped down in its present form out of the sky, and they really don't give any thought to uh, <laughs> Church history whatsoever. But yeah. you just pointed out what, what one of the um, points that should be made about the importance of Church history, that uh, this isn't some new sect that has just started here uh, in this this century. This is something that has come down down through the ages, correct? Yeah, no, you're very correct, Kevin. And, and I've heard John MacArthur say, sadly, that the contemporary church, you would think by listening to its leaders that the church, that Pentecost took place 20 years ago, hmm. uh, that the church was birthed, you know, 15 years ago, and everything previous to that, uh, is unimportant and really has no effect upon our lives today. And, and that would really be uh, to live like a spiritual ostrich and just put your head in the sand and live in denial of reality that there is a long line of godly men and women who have preceded us, and we are not divorced from them. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly when we arrive in heaven... Uh, we will be among that redeemed host. We are presently surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and I think it is incumbent upon us to be aware of those who have preceded us. Uh, the, the famous line is, is that what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Hmm. And <laughs> we, we want to learn from history. Yeah. And... Uh, There's nothing new under the sun, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are just uh, every generation just in one way or another reengages in the same debate. Mm -hmm. It's just the names are changed Mm -hmm. and the locations are changed. And so 
uh, when I was in seminary, just a word of personal testimony, I learned more theology in my historical theology classes than I did in my systematic theology classes. Hmm. Because church history um, addresses the pivotal points of, of theology. Uh, you, you speak directly to those issues in which history hinged, and, and there were significant uh, intersections uh, where the church went one of two directions, and you read of the greatest minds in the history of the church, those brilliant intellects gifted by God, how they approached that issue from Scripture. And so it, it would be, I think, arrogant um, on my part if I tried to study Scripture and theology without uh, making myself privy to what minds far greater than me, ha how they have already weighed in on those issues. Mm -hmm. And so we, we learn so much from these men who have gone before us. I think we become deeper theologically. Um, I, I think we become better taught, and we are able to trace their, uh, their chain of thinking from A to B to C to D, and it, and it sharpens us. Uh, it's just like jogging with someone who has picked up their pace. It, it really motivates you to, to widen your stride and to pick up the pace as you run. And the same is true in the study of church history. Uh, and I, I love to quote John Piper. He says, my best friends are dead men. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I learn more, he says, from dead men than from living men. Mm. And, and so what a shallow existence it would be. It would be like living in a cave yeah. if we did not make ourselves av uh, available uh, or did not avail ourselves uh, to these great minds who have gone before us. And it, sh and it also, Kevin, should serve as a confirmation to us mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that as we discover these truths in Scripture, we don't want to be the only person to ever see this. The old saying, if it's new, it's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think after tw after 2,000 years of church history that you finally see something that no one else has seen before you, um, I can assure you that what you're seeing, you're reading your Bible upside down. Mm. Um, because if, if it is a, a significant matter in Scripture, the great minds before us have already wrestled with those passages and, and there will be a concert of, uh, of unity of voices uh, that begin to s confirm and speak to that truth. Mm -hmm. here, so, we, here we are at the celebration of the first advent of Christ, and a lot of these teachings are, uh, from the early church fathers and some of the councils that were held uh, come to my mind very often, where we sing a hymn where it talks about uh, Christ emptying himself. I'm immediately thinking about those uh, Christological debates that took place as to the person of Christ, two natures in, uh, in union there uh, in Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ, not two persons, but two natures, only one divine person. They're, they're extremely relevant and extremely important in what we do today. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that, uh, and I think it's put this way in the book, maybe by Albert Moeller, that to our own peril or to our own ignorance, uh, we go ahead and, and just ignore what was done here up until this point, specifically with the church fathers. We're going to take a very quick commercial break, and when we come back from that break, uh, Dr. Lawson, I'm going to ask you to do the impossible. We'll take a little bit of a snapshot of like the apostolic fathers and then the apologetic fathers and so forth and just ask you to give us a quick snapshot of what our uh, listeners would find in each one of those chapters. Again, we're speaking with uh, Dr. Steve Lawson is our special guest today. He's the author of the book that we're talking about today, Pillars of Grace. This was uh, it's going to be coming out in February. It's published by Reformation uh, Trust Publishing. I'll tell you more about that when we come back from the break. You're listening to Knowing the Truth with Pastor Kevin Bowling. For more information about today's program, the radio ministry, and the resources we offer, go to www.knowingthetruth.org. 
Information to start your day on Christian Worldview Today. So I just thought you might like to know about this. This organization is called the Congressional Muslim Staff Association. And uh, they're, they're, they're praying and meeting every Friday at the United States Capitol, bringing in terrorists of international renown, of all stripes, to lead the prayer service. Join Dr. Tony Beam weekday mornings from 7 to 9 on Christian Talk 660 at 92.9 FM. It's great pizza for a great price. So pack up the family and head over to Stevie B's near Walmart on Woodruff Road in Greenville. At Stevie B's, you'll find friendly faces and at least a dozen pizzas out at all times. Or you can order a pizza and they'll make it fresh just for you with no extra cost. So visit Stevie B's today. Hi, this is Pastor Kevin Bowling, and I want to take the time to thank John, Ruth, Carlos, and the good folks over there at Stevie B's Pizza for their support of the Knowing the Truth radio broadcast. With media, entertainment, and even our public school systems now being virtual training grounds for sin and rebellion, parents are finding themselves at war not only with their teens, but with our entire culture. Hi, I'm Trey Sembry, founder and director of Shepherd Hill Farm. Shepherd Hill Farm is a Christ-centered residential ministry and fully accredited school for struggling teens. Teens labeled with a myriad of common diagnoses are leaving Shepherd Hill Farm medication-free. Science has now confirmed what Scripture has known from the beginning. Humans need God. Shepherd Hill Farm offers a loving and secure authoritative community atmosphere conducive for life change. I see it regularly. It's Jesus Christ who is doing the healing because our first commitment is to Him. Shepherd Hill Farm is an intense discipleship training ground, a proving ground for God's healing power for families across the country and around the world. To enroll or sponsor a teen, go to HelpMyTroubledTeen.org. That's HelpMyTroubledTeen.org. Welcome back to Knowing the Truth with Pastor Kevin Bowling. Information regarding the resources referenced on today's program can be found at www.knowingthetruth.org. Now, here to continue with today's program is Pastor Kevin Bowling. Hey, welcome back into the second half of the Knowing the Truth radio program. In fact, I was a little long on the first segment, and I took the break a little bit late. And I only mentioned that to say that uh, you'll have limited time then to get involved in the program today. Uh, but your uh, participation is welcomed, and you're invited to participate in the discussion today. Be happy to take your question or your call for our special guest today, Dr. Steve Lawson. Um, let me give you the information about how you can do that, and then I'm uh, talk Talk about a couple other items, and then we'll go right back to our discussion. If you'd like to uh, give us a call here at the program uh, at the station, now get your question or comment in to the program that way. We've set up a toll-free number one triple eight six sixty WLFJ. That's one eight eight eight. Six six zero nine five three five. That number is good across the country, and so be happy to take your question or comment that way. I also have email up and running, and my email address is Kevin at KevinAtKnowingTheTruth.org. It's very simply just K-E-V-I-N at KnowingTheTruth.org. I have Twitter up and running as well, and so if you want to just uh, send a tweet, I put a couple of um, little questions out there already. I said that the early church fathers teach Calvin. Calvinism. I know that the, <laughs> that's not historically correct, but I was just trying to uh, get some uh, response there from the folks on Twitter about this subject. I know it would be more proper to say the doctrines of grace, but uh, you can certainly welcome to send a tweet that way with your question or your comment, and I'll make sure to get it uh, into our discussion here today as well. The account on uh, Twitter is Knowing the Truth, all one word, and so you can go there in order to post your question question or your comment today about our discussion. I mentioned that we're speaking with uh, Dr. Steve Lawson. Uh, he's the uh, um, author of a, a book previous to this that's part of the same series. The series is referred to as A Long Line of Godly Men. His previous book that I did do an interview with him about as well is called The Foundations of Grace. In fact, you can find all of the interviews that I've done with uh, Dr. Lawson about all of his excellent books, the one about Jonathan Edwards as well as the one about uh, John Calvin, the expository preaching of John Calvin. All of those uh, archived uh, interviews are out at the website, two different websites for you to go to. One would, uh, simple one would be knowingthetruth.org 
www.knowingthetruth.org, www.knowingthetruth.org. And the second would be sermonaudio.com forward slash knowing the truth. And you can go out there and find them. By the way, Dr. Lawson's uh, weekly sermons are also out there. If you just type in uh, Steve Lawson in the search engine there on Sermon Audio, it'll take you to their church website and you'll be able to listen to uh, Dr. Lawson on a regular basis. Uh, That's available to you on Sermon Audio as well. I wanted to uh, mention that I don't have books to give away today. I normally do. But like I said, this book is not going to uh, come out until February. And the reason why I'm doing the interview now is, uh, first of all, I think it would make a tremendous gift, a tremendous uh, Christmas gift. You can go ahead and pre-order that, I think, out on Ligonier's um, website, www.ligonier.org. Go there and just type in uh, Steve Lawson into the search engine, and it'll bring up uh, these books, especially under the Reformation Trust section or their their book section of that website. And you can pre-order this book then. And it would make a wonderful Christmas gift, especially if you have someone in your family, uh, wives listening today, maybe your husbands or or, uh, folks in your church, maybe you're thinking about your pastor. I'm not trying to get one just for myself, by the way, (laughs) but maybe your pastor. And uh, you could could get, this would be a tremendous gift for you to buy for your pastor and your church. It would be um, just, I know I would appreciate it, and it would just be something that uh, would really be helpful. In fact, Let me read to you what um, I think it was the end of the uh, statement that is made here by Dr. Albert Moeller in in the beginning of the book. He says this. He says, let me mention one last point. Uh, Dr. Lawson taught through this material with his men's group in his own congregation before he gave it to the larger church for our benefit and edification. As a fellow pastor, that piques my interest. Just think of what a blessing it would be to have a congregation whose officers and male leaders are steeped in the knowledge of the truth, the Bible, and the church history that Dr. Lawson provides here. Fellow pastors, by all means, use this material for your own growth and knowledge and grace. Pillage it for illustrations and content in your preaching. Encourage your women's Bible studies and small groups to consider using this material for their edification. Do not neglect to to teach your young men, and especially your officers, the truth contained herein. Your whole congregation will rise up and call you blessed for doing so. For godly men, gripped by the grace and truth, will serve their wives and their children and their parents and their fellow fellow members so well that it will um, be blessed together with them in the study of this truth. And so uh, I couldn't agree with him more. In fact, Dr. Lawson has made it easy for you to do that because... And I think I'm going to do this at my church as well, only I'm not going to limit it to the men. If I do, I know I would have some of the women of the church rise up and ask me why I was only going through this study with the men. So I think we're going to do it in our Sunday school lesson. But at the end of each one of these chapters, in both books, there is a um, a study question section, one page that lists uh, seven or eight different questions out of the chapter that you have just read. And so this is very easy to go through, to uh, select the highlights from that chapter, to teach them in your Sunday school class, and then even to have study questions at the end already created for you. I don't think you could ask for anything more than that by way of being able to teach through this material. So I highly recommend it. Um, Dr. Lawson, let's get back to just... Uh, getting a little bit of a snapshot of what is covered in these uh, segments that you have here. You start with a couple of chapters dealing with the Apostolic Fathers, a couple of different date ranges for the Apostolic Fathers. But if you would, please, just give us a little snapshot of what our, our listeners would find in that opening few chapters. Certainly. Well, the Apostolic Fathers were, were those early Christian leaders who served at the end of the first century and the first half of the second century, and they either knew the apostles, were taught by the the apostles, or uh, were contemporaries uh, of the apostles. Mm. And so they are our closest connection uh, with the apostles, and that's why we call them apostolic fathers. 
And the two key figures there are Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch. And both of these men make decisively, uh, decidedly uh, Calvinistic statements regarding uh, the doctrines of grace. And uh, first, Clement is is really one of the oldest extra-biblical pieces of ancient literature that we have, if not the oldest. Uh, I think it's slightly uh, younger than, let's say, the Didache. Um, But as we read this, uh, we are impressed uh, that this man is is speaking to the doctrines of election, uh, the doctrines of uh, predestination, the doctrines of uh, irresistible grace, especially God's preserving grace, the eternal security of the believer. And then Ignatius, uh, he makes the very same statements as well. And, and I think we would expect this for men who uh, were so closely connected in time uh, with the apostles. So that, that's where uh, I began. I have a chapter each uh, for each of those two men, Clement of Rome and Ignatius of, of Antioch. Um, if you'd like for me to continue yeah, going... From, I, I, from, from the Apostolic Fathers, uh, you yeah. go down to the uh, Apologist Fathers, beginning with uh, Justin Martyr. So just again, a little snapshot of yeah. the Apologist Fathers, that would be great. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the Apologists are, are called this because they really tried to give a defense for the Christian faith in the midst of a Greek mindset, a Greek world that was very uh, given to philosophy. And so these men tried to use philosophy along with biblical truth to give a a good hearing for the the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Mm -hmm. Justin Martyr uh, is really the foremost of of those apologists. And uh, and again, he makes very uh, decisive statements regarding uh, the doctrines of grace. Now, at this time, Kevin, they are also speaking uh, about free will. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they haven't had to come to grips with completely how this all fits together, um, h- how all these bits and pieces of theology, uh, which is a master doctrine and truth that governs other, mas- uh, uh, other lesser truths. And, uh, and so in a sense, they're talking a little bit out of both sides of their mouth. I don't mean that in a hypocritical way, just that they haven't been forced to tie down all these loose threads while mm-hmm. they are presenting uh, the gospel out in the marketplace to an unbelieving Roman and Greek world. But nevertheless, when they come to passages that speak to the doctrines of grace, there is no holding back on their part, and, and they speak very clearly. Uh, and, of course, Gnosticism was was a huge heresy that they were having to combat as well. Hmm. One of our uh, listeners has uh, sent me a, a tweet there on Twitter, and they said that um, asked Dr. Lawson to um, I- explain the dangers of prevenient grace or uh, prevent prevent prevenient grace. Yes, uh, which I think was a, a, a Wesley uh, may yeah. have did that as well. Yeah. Well, what prevenient grace? teaches is a watered-down version of what you and I would hold to from Scripture, meaning it doesn't go far enough. Mm. Uh, It simply teaches that the Holy Spirit prior to the new birth would simply be uh, stirring up uh, desires and shining, you know, some light, but not uh, bringing the sinner, drawing the sinner all the way to Christ and not bestowing the gift of saving faith and repentance. And so therefore it it teaches a a synergistic approach to regeneration that God and man must both cooperate with each other in order for one to be born again. That's really where prevenient grace finds its place in in, in church history. And it, it really does not consider the sinner to be dead and trespasses and sin, that there's still some moral ability left in the center uh, and such that he just needs more of a, a nudge in the right direction. And um, prevenient, prevenient grace really addresses uh, a lesser ministry of the Holy Spirit 
in um, prior to conversion. It, it's, mm. it's not strong enough, and it does not go all the way. Mm. Oh, well, thank you very much for addressing that. I appreciate it. And um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in studying the, the Church Fathers and all of the different categories that you list here in the book, uh, yeah. uh, African Fathers, I think, is where we're going next, but in studying these, was there one that surprised you, that as you began the study, uh, that you were just surprised at how many statements are actually made uh, relating to the doctrines of grace in a particular writer? Sure. Well, there there would be a number of those, Kevin, but uh, certainly um, Athanasius, mm. uh, who was a very capable uh, theologian, uh, makes very strong statements regarding the relationship between Adam's fall, the sin of mankind, and the sovereignty of grace. Mm. Uh, really, the two doctrines of sin and grace, sin and grace. Uh, need to be closely studied together in a cause and effect relationship. And the depth to which one understands sin, the more you have to emphasize the sovereignty of God in grace. Mm. And and so Athanasius, uh, although he did not understand to the fullest extent, nevertheless, he really begins to tie together some of these loose threads. Uh, Tertullian, uh, who was a brilliant mind, uh, who first even gave us the, the coinage of uh, Trinity and mm. New Testament and words that find their way into our uh, English vocabulary in the church, uh, he, he also made some very important statements um, regarding the sovereignty of God in, in grace. Mm. Cyprian was very strong in the perseverance of the saints. Uh, the eternal security of, of believers. So I, I would draw a circle around the, uh, those men. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. Uh, we had talked about, most people don't really think about the idea of theology coming out of Africa, per se, but we owe a tremendous debt to the African fathers, right? Huge, absolutely huge. Mm. Uh, in, in these early centuries, once we get out of the first century, where Jerusalem is the hub, and, and then let's say places like Rome, when you start the second century, second, third, and fourth, even into the fifth century, uh, Africa is where it's at. Mm. Uh, that's where the major theologians were, all the way to Augustine. And, and so uh, the debt of love or gratitude that we have for the early church in Africa, it would be difficult to overstate uh, their strategic importance in early uh, church history. So as, you, as you're able to, to read my book, and, and, and this is an easy book to read as well, Kevin, mm -hmm. although it's almost 600 pages, it's, it's a, a pretty full treatment. Nevertheless, it, it, it's written at, at a lay level. Mm -hmm. uh, where I, I found that, and I bear testimony to that, too. I've been reading it, and I'm even reading it electronically, yeah. uh, which uh, it's not even in a reader, so I'm just reading it in a PDF form, like a manuscript form. Yeah. And uh, it, I, I noted the exact same thing, that uh, for to get an understanding of the Church Fathers, uh, there's a, just a tremendous history lesson here, but it's easy to read. It's not very difficult at all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of that goes back, really, to R.C. Sproul's ministry, mm -hmm. as he's taken profound truth and brought it out of the ivory tower and put it in the pew where it's understandable for the, for the, for the layperson. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried to follow that same uh, genre uh, of writing such that I think anyone would find this uh, easily accessible as they would pick it up and read it. Mm, I should mention that uh, you've actually dedicated uh, this second huh. book to uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul, and uh, your first book was uh, dedicated to another one of your mentors, but uh, you dedicate this one to Dr. Sproul, and you even put in the end of it, if I remember correctly, that uh, you would think that history will show um, that Dr. Sproul was the Martin Luther of our time on issues like this. Uh, absolutely. I uh, Dr. Agree. Sproul is a, is a professor of mine from previous years, and 
his imprint upon my life uh, is a, uh, a lasting influence. Mm. And so our, it, this is a very affectionately uh, dedicated to Dr. Sproul. Mm. Obviously, with our time constraint today, we won't be able to go through a number of these, but I can't help but us uh, fast-forwarding to uh, sure. Augustine or <laughs> to Augustine, as some people would say. I guess if you're a different level of spirituality, you say it different ways. But uh, <laughs> uh, um, but I'll just say Augustine. And uh, sometimes uh, we find that uh, Catholicism claims Augustine related to uh, Ecclesiastes, hierarchy or something in that category, but uh, certainly Augustine was the champion of the doctrines of grace, of articulating them most fu- fully. Would that be a true statement? That, that is very true, and both the Reformers and Rome claimed uh, Augustine as a forefather, and R.C. Sproul actually has described the Protestant Revolu- uh, Reformation as really the 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 triumph of uh, Augustine's theology on grace as triumphing over Augustine's theology on the church mm. and 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 that's really true um, and uh, Augustine was the first to begin to tightly connect the the radical corruption and total depravity of the human will Uh, to teach the bondage of the human will in sin and the necessity of what we would call a monergistic regeneration, meaning that God is the sole agent at work in the human heart. Uh, There is not cooperation by man because man is dead and trespasses in sin, that God must first impart uh, life to the dead soul and give the gifts of repentance and faith before the spiritually dead sinner can believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Uh, Augustine uh, was, was very clear in this, and um, those who would follow Augustine really for the next thousand years to the Reformation uh, would r- refer back to the teaching of Augustine, and, and he got it right in that area. Now, the, his teaching on the church was fuzzy, and that is why Rome claims him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there would need to be yet further clarification of the full body of truth. But Augustine really is the towering figure for the first 1,500 years of church history. Hmm. You end then in this book, and we'll fast forward all of the way to your last chapter, the yeah. uh, theologian for the ages, you call him Swiss reformer John Calvin, obviously taught this uh, so deeply in his writings that his name uh, often is used synonymously for the doctrines of grace, uh, to speaking about Calvinism, but uh, just really articulated and, and, and filled this out uh, like no other theologian. Would you agree? Oh, I would totally agree, and the reason for that is Calvin taught the Bible as no other Amen. theologian. <laughs> uh, the more you teach the Bible, the more you dig into the doctrines of grace. And so because Calvin was such a biblical expositor and a biblical theologian, he was left with no choice but to address these truths again and again and again. Hmm. And, and, of course, he had the towering intellect as well uh, to go with that. But uh, you and I have talked in the past about how Calvin was such a verse-by-verse consecutive expositor of Scripture, yes. uh, and because he was so deeply rooted and grounded in the text of Scripture, he therefore uh, became such a proponent of the doctrines of grace, because he was just teaching the Bible. Amen. I, I still profit from our conversations that we had on that. Let me, let me yeah. read this statement uh, just to thank you for what you've done here in putting this book together. This is from Ligon Duncan. He says, thank you, Dr. Lawson for your labors in pulling together this rich treasury of biblical teaching on the doctrine of grace over the centuries from faithful men whom Christ appointed and the Spirit endowed for the building up of the saints and the work of service, for the work of service. We are your grateful debtors. Dear reader, join me now in this epic journey of edification guided by this faithful shepherd of our souls. I say, well said, Ligon Duncan. It's, uh, it relays my sentiments as well, and I know many others. 
Dr. Lawson, thank you for writing this book and for being with us on the program today. Oh, thank you, Kevin. You and I are kindred spirits, and I, I really thank the Lord for your ministry there. Thank you, brother. You've been listening to Knowing the Truth with Pastor Kevin Bowling. Knowing the Truth is the outreach ministry of the Mountain Bridge Bible Fellowship, located on Highway 25 in Traveler's Rest. For more information about the church and radio ministry, visit us on the web at knowingthetruth.org. The opinions expressed on today's program are those of the announcers, their guests, and callers, and do not necessarily represent those of the staff and management of his radio network, the radio training network, or Clear Channel Communications. Life-changing teaching and talk for the Carolinas in Georgia. Christian Talk 660. WLFJ Greenville, Spartanburg, Anderson. Fox News Radio, I'm Lisa Brady. The White House, undaunted by a Democrat...